There we go. All right, very good. So we're actually to the heart and uh, center of the book. Ooh, exciting. So it's been, morning Matt, oh. worth our time <laughs> to get to this point, to the heart and center of the book, because um, so, you've had lots of introduction, and uh, now we can dig deep into to the point. Remember, uh, so he's following kind of a common, common form, not one that we, used to, we usually do in the Western world. In fact, um, you probably had preachers like this for a long time, where they would tell you what they were going to preach, and then they would preach it, and then at the end they tell you what they just preached. <laughs> no, I, but it's what you do. Like Today the sermon will be in three points, point one, point two, point three, and then they do point one. Here are the three points. It's really good for learning, right? Um, yeah, with the review at the end and whatnot. Um, but... Once, if that's the only form you ever hear, then you realize that actually you really don't have to pay attention in the middle and at the end. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Um, but this is also a letter. So it has, I think, it's, I think it's quite intentionally composed. But instead of, this is common in Hebrew poetry, especially in Hebrew, Hebrew writing, is that you, you introduce ideas, you get to the main idea, and then you have the consequence of that idea kind of spin out. But the, the, the actual main idea is not at the front. It's right in the middle. A little deceiving for us. All right? Because you, you would expect to have the main point introduced in the beginning. Now, in some ways it was because we had all those words that he kind of tossed out. But not with a lot of um, explicate that today. First, though, let's review the end of what we read last week. Remember, it's artificial. Just, they were imposed by rabbis in the 10th century, so uh, or, or other Christians. So they are helpful for us to find our way around. But the paragraph breaks next, not even the periods and the commas. <laughs> so all of that is a little bit interpretive. All right. So let's read one through five to review last week. All right, so faith in Christ is really the big key the word there, I think, probably at the end. Um, and remember, we, we've talked about this many times, but uh, I was just listening to, actually, that they, all of the, the, the heresies, some of which that we've had to directly deal with as Lutherans, have been about multiple sources of authority. And what? You could have all sorts of different ones. Can you think of that? Um, think of some church bodies. What can we pick on? Yeah, so we could pick on Rome. We could say it's Jesus and the Pope, although they don't usually say the Pope. The Vatican. The, not the Vatican. The stuff from the seat. That's current seat. So it's the councils and decrees of the Pope, of the papacy. You're saying the Holy See, right? The Holy See, the holy see yeah, the See, which is just, yeah, we call it seat. Yeah, the see or the seat. Right. And so when he's on, only when he's sitting on his chair um, is it authoritative. The things he says to the reporters on the airplane don't really matter. They're just personal opinion. At least that's what they tell. Although then we seem, seem to see the, the things that he says on the airplane a few years later end up official documents. But what can I say? Yeah, so two, two strange. Now, they, another way to say that is scripture, God's word, and tradition. Right. In that case, it's the tradition of the of the papacy, but if you were in another church body, it would be the of like in the east of the of the fathers. They would say so that comes alongside God, and that it's it's not subordinate, but it, it's it's now uh, there's other traditions um, more recently, especially in America, because we the best heresies come out of the United 
Um, we are a hotbed for heresy um, because of freedom. So you're free to do whatever you want. King's not going to kill you if you're a heretic, so go for it. See how it goes. Um, revivalism. Not all revivalism is, is, is necessarily, um, but in particular, the revivalists who said, I have a revelation from God. I have a revelation from God. God has spoken to me. Right? And some n- notorious ones Joseph there. Smith. there. Joseph Smith. Thank you, Ethan. I don't know why you said it quite like that, but that's okay. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Joseph Smith is a good example. Where the angel, great name for an angel. You know, angel moron. Yeah, moron. The moron angel came and spoke to him and gave him tablets written in hieroglyphics, which only he could decode. So he decoded them. Gift, and then he destroyed them because nobody else could read them anyway. So why would we need to be able to read the originals? Um, so we would get to read his copies translated into English. Anyway, that special revelation that comes alongside God's word. And well, hey, by the way, the lost tribe. Guess who the lost tribe is? The American Indians. All right? You, you all know that. But no, actually, they came from Cobol. That's a whole other story. Don't start to get really sci-fi very quick. Um, oh, that, well, then there's other examples. Now, that's a, that's a good one because it's God's word and. Right? Now, there are that are just like, well, no, we have a new revelation that actually supersedes God's word entirely. Yeah. All right. Um, so there's that, too. Jehovah's Witnesses would be another one. We've, all of you have been reading the Bible wrong, right? And then, uh, by the yeah. So... This is, those are, those are some typical ones, but I think that's not what actually defines today, because today God's word, for the most part, doesn't really matter to people at all. Did, did anybody watch the, um, any of the proceedings at the United Methodist? It was their 20, yeah, it was their, it was their 2002. So they canceled 2020, and they had it this year, and they still called it the 2020 conference. You can mock that if you want. It seems a little silly, doesn't it? But... Bunny was going to be catastrophic. And then, oh, oh, look, COVID, we have to cancel because, because of the, um, the alphabet people controversy in their church body. A fair number of people, meaning they had been ordaining women for debt for 100 years, but um, then the slippery slope, right? And it's like, well, then what, what's to exclude? I didn't know what to talk about. Got it. <laughs> you made it. Um, anyway, so the, the conference, it was very interesting because there was one guy who stood up and uh, he was from Liberia. And the African Methodists are like, what's wrong with everybody? Like, we have the Bible. What's wrong with you people? And then uh, and they're like, no, like all sorts of things now. And God is a revelation. And they even, the opening address as to the rules of the convention said, you can't, you need to avoid referring to God in gendered pronouns. Oh. Like he... Yeah, exactly. All right, so that tells you that. That's not tradition. Well, um, what's that? It is a kind of psychosis. No, no, that's not. That's not bad. That's true. All right. This, this is this is the god of the age, the spirit of the age. We would say, right? If you're a German weirdo, All right? Zeitgeist. Um, the spirit of the age, but the spirit of the age isn't really the spirit out here that we're all being held captive to. No, it's Luther was right about this. He, he figured this out 500 years ago, that what it was is these demons and there's false teaching and there's the oppression of the world, but it has an ally with the, the sinful heart. So really, it's not the spirit of the age, it's the spirit of, of the sinful heart of man. Man says, sorry, God, I don't care what you say. This is what I think is true, right? And that's the original sin, of course. <laughs> God, did God really say? Well, kind of, but, oh, yeah, well, you make a good point, serpent. That's something, actually, we would, we would like to, to reach out and take what God did not give to us. That's interesting. So, um, why did we bring that up? Well, because that's exactly what he's dealing with here, is it's not... It's not like tradition. He's not dealing with the church where they have a tradition that's contrary to God's word. This is the spirit of the age, the spirit of God within. 
Um, it, a great way to diagnose this is people who say, um, that's your truth and my truth. If you hear people say that, um, some people just do it innocently. I don't think that's the way we talk. That's the way people are talking. But, but that can't be, from, at least from the scripture's perspective, the way, the truth, and the life. That means there is an objective truth, and it's the person of Jesus, ultimately. Right? Truth is, you listen to Jesus. And it's objective. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. It's still true. But if you don't believe it, of course, then <laughs> all sorts of things happen as a consequence. All right. So their problem is, is that they have been looking for wisdom and knowledge apart from what? Faith in Christ, right? And that's by persuasive words. I mean, if, I mean, that is the definition of what happened in the garden, isn't it? They were, you, Adam was deceived, Eve as well, with, with persuasive persuasive words, not the full assurance of understanding, the knowledge of the mystery of God that was in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So all wisdom and knowledge is not here and you don't go and pursue it and find it. It's revealed to you in the person and work of Jesus whom God has given. So that was his assertion there last week. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now this is, I mean, Probably for you, unless you've dealt with people who are outside of our tradition or uh, Bible-believing church. I guess we call them conservative today. I don't necessarily like that word because it's become very political. But almost exclusively, everybody who has joined this church since COVID, specific, well, even before COVID, came specifically because we didn't deny the fullness of God's word. And they came from churches where, well... Maybe not entirely, but bits and pieces were being set aside. Called it the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. Right? We just don't like that part. So we're just going to set that part aside. It's just, you know, whether it's male or female or whatever it is. Um, so uh, maybe for you, this is like, well, of course the Bible is the sole rule, of, for faith, rule and norm for faith and life. Right? Which is what our Constitution says, quoting the form. It's true. Um, that's not true for, um, unfortunately, many Christians, if not most, most church bodies these days. It's really kind of sad, you know. Uh, any questions so far? <coughs> Thoughts, comments? Okay. All right. So now we'll get to the heart. Say. Mm. What's that? that being yeah, of course. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> now we're getting into the fun territory in regards to the letter. Go ahead. Sometimes they're, they're either like misinterpreting it or they're saying, hey, we're going to. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I used, the, I used the expression slippery slope before. I'm borrowing it from the revivalists, but I, or backsliding. Um, but it's not false. I mean, Christians sometimes are accused of, like, well, you know. What was it? Oh, Obergefell. Why are you so opposed to a burgization of same-sex marriage by the through fiat by the Supreme Court? Basically, no law was passed. They just interpreted the existing laws, um, the civil rights status, statutes, and and the Christians were oh well, you know it's not that's it's just these are monogamous same-sex couples. It's not going to result in any anything worse. You're all just fear mongering. We're like, no, this is a slippery slope. And step, and the next step is going to be, and then <laughs> the stuff you see in the parades, right on the news. And you're like, well, wait, they, those were before, but now, what is it? Something like, uh, Ethan, your age, the, or, you know, the younger people. It's something like more than half are identifying as some other gender, gender fluid, queer. Which, you're like. Well, why? Because it's publicly acceptable. So the acceptable, well encouraged too. Yes, yes, right. But it can be encouraged because first it has to be accepted. Then it can, then it has to be condoned, or then it then it's condoned. Then it's so like for example, um, yeah. This is this is actually the first use of God's law. the The use of the law as a curb, right? Like you know, if we there's a speed limit, but if they don't post the speed limit signs. You're just going to go whatever speed you want, right? Until you get pulled over. And then you'll be like, well, they're like, well, but you should just know. 
How well does that work? That's a field. You know, the law has to be posted and regularly and consistently, right? So that, so that, uh, so that it more or less curbs you. And I drove to Iowa back, back yesterday, so and a fair fair chunk of that is uh, like you don't see anybody for miles and miles and miles. It's like, deer. what's the speed limit for? Or, not sure. I guess deer or something. Anyway, you get the idea. So without the curb, right, then, then the gates are opened in a sense. Boundaries. Yeah, the boundaries. Yeah. So it's right for the civil law to establish boundaries. We had the same thing with, with the legalization of uh, no-fault divorce. Okay. And we're like, oh, I'm sure there were people saying, you know, we... You, you need to drop your heavy-handed ideas that the government doesn't have, any, doesn't have any reason to protect marriage. You're like, well, marriage is the basis of, of the government, civilization. So anyway, and then you see, what, you see where that's gone. Where you, you know, we have a, even a, in the Christian congregation who, are, who, are, who have been divorced, like, which was unheard of even amongst the Christian church. Well, why? Because it's legally permissive, right? And so then, well, of course. And maybe that happened before they were Christians, etc. But, um, but it's not good, is the point. It's not good. All right, so I don't know. Why do we talk slippery slope? Uh, good order. Good order. I don't remember. Oh, yeah. Well, you are getting into that. Yes. It did say that. Rejoicing to see your good order and steadfast. And those good is added. It's implied there. Uh, remember, and then we talked two weeks ago that Paul actually does have some authority over them. Ah, this is something I wanted to bring up too. Thank you. I'm doing lots of introduction. Um, we're also radically individualistic today. We're actually kind of, we have this weird hybrid. I don't know who I was talking to about this. Maybe one of you. Um, that today we are both radically individualistic, but also highly corporate. Right? You have to do what's good for the environment. You know. Or the greater good for the where the mass and take the shots for the greater good of all society, and yet we're all so highly individual. Your truth, my truth. Why don't you more than snooze it, but cancel it? Yeah. Um, and uh, the, so then, when we get to this kind of language, where Paul is writing to a church, and he's accusing, going to accuse all of them corporately as a church. Well, pastor, you could talk to that person privately. But don't accuse us all of you know, um, ever rebuke corporately, pretty much. We don't ever say, like, we as a congregation failed. Or, um, or we as a nation are apostate. We've, for, we've forsaken God. Well, because there's a separation here. You're not allowed to say that or something, right? But is it not true, though? Like, are, as, a, as a people living within a certain degree as a whole, have, have we used his word? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so nation at any point or another, it doesn't, that's not even the point. The point is, do we listen to God in his word? And is that, is that the basis for our, our faith in life? And also corporate life, government life. Right? So, so that, that might seem a little weird that he's actually talking to them corporately as a, as a congregation. Right, um, but um, he has authority to do so. He's certainly an apostle, and uh, yeah, there. This is all over in Paul. Is what one member of the body does affects the whole body. I think we talked about that, right? Uh, that's especially true in First Corinthians. Okay, let's get to the meat then. So uh, we actually want to do. Ooh, I don't even know. I, I guess let's read a bigger chunk. Let's do 6 through uh, 15 for this break here because we're not going to keep going. going. Well, my, my version does. So. Oh, that's so nice. Good. Yeah. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live and build up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive to follow and subject philosophy, which depends on human tradition the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ, who the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given the fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised, in the putting off of the sinful nature, 
not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the original code with its regulations that was against us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Yeah, that's good. All right, so then, and then he's going to spin out the rest of the chapter and into chapter three. Then, now what's the implicate life together? But we need to talk about what, what is the central theme then. All right. So you have, therefore, you have received Christ Jesus our Lord, the Lord. Past tense. Past tense with, it's actually not past. Everybody know the grammar? Have received. It's passive. Yeah. Have received. What, what kind of verb is that? If I search it. I'll see what it is in, in Greek. Active, indicative, second person, plural. Oh, that's really helpful. <laughs> Grammar. Um, yeah, you have, you, the aorist can be translated a couple different ways, but here it's translated with a passive sense. So you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. When did you receive Christ Jesus your Lord? Yeah. In your baptism, correct. And through the word. Um, so walk in him. That's interesting. Interesting preposition, right? Be walking in him, in him. I thought we follow him, or we walk to him, or we walk with him, in him, right? So, um, efficiency. Where do you find your strength? In him, correct, right? Walk here, we talked about this before, earlier in the chapter, that by walk, it's not like a literal walk. This is the, the walk of... Well, I am the I am the light that lights the path. I am the path. I am the way. That's the way. Language of of walk and way is it's. How do we use the way? Way not just for a path, but also for. We call it the way of life, right? A way of life. As yeah, as an adverb, and, and way of life means, like, how, how would you define that? Your way of life. How we live. Yeah, like the how. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but the, your way of life, I think it refers even more, more deeply to principles that guide you, right? Yeah, so what is it that guides your life? Well, here it's Jesus, right? <laughs> All right. So he, he's both guiding, how do we say it? Your word is the lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Yeah, right. In him. And then it's funny because if you're walking, now you're rooted. <laughs> how much walking can you do? I love Paul. Paul does this all the time. Just metaphor mixing all the time. It's like, well, that's another metaphor. Fine. But we're rooted and then built up. So you've got, you've got pilgrimage and you've got construction all in one, <laughs> one little expression here, right? Up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught. So this is key. We talked about this back in chapter one. Is where does the knowledge and wisdom, the fullness of the knowledge and wisdom come from? Does it come from within? No, it comes from working through the word, through the ears, as you've been taught. Right? And again, this is, this is key with the body and the flesh, is that if you look to find out about Jesus by looking within, the Jesus you find is that's revealed to you in God's word. It's a different Jesus, different spirit. Right? Um, I'm listening to a podcast that uh, Luke was, Luke, listening to him the other day. Ethan heard some of the same. And uh, he decided that uh, he'd been saying for like a year, I listened to it for other content, but that I follow um, um, like the Buddha and Aristotle and Jesus. This is what he'd been saying, right? Like they all have helpful teaching. And I knew at some point he was going to be like, what does Jesus actually teach? Right? Compatible with Buddha and Aristotle. <laughs> um, is it, is is it compatible with Greek? So the last couple episodes he's had, or not weeks, he's had some Christian thinkers on to talk to him. He had a, a guy from a Dallas Theological Seminary, so that's like evangelical. He had a Roman Catholic on that we listened to yesterday. And you can hear that he's starting to see, that's the Jesus that I thought I was following is not the Jesus that's in the Bible. 
Right? Well, no wonder, right? Unless you, you ever know. Because you think Jesus is, like, what is the world? Buddy Jesus, right? Yeah, he gets us. That's right. That was the Super Bowl commercial, right? Yeah, he gets us. Well, yes, he gets you. And that's why he died for you. Because <laughs> he knows your sin as intimately as you do. Or maybe even more so. Because we deceive ourselves. All right. So, um, so it's as you've been taught. Now, that's going to be hard. Because that also means, as we talked about yes, uh, yesterday, no, Friday, prayer, there's a necessity to discern between the spirits. All right. Um, you've, you've probably, some of you grew up in, or lived in the 80s and 90s, and the, the most popular place for Christians to go was the Christian bookstore after church, right? Anybody Christian bookstore? Yeah. The, the challenge of a Christian bookstore is which Christian? <laughs> yeah. Which faith, right? What do they confess? And uh, it's kind of like Walmart, right? It's like we got, um, we got something for everybody. But it's usually the diluted version of everything. It's nothing very profound and everything kind of, you know. So this is why people like Rick Warren and uh, the, the televangelist crowd, right? Um, Saddleback. But who is a uh, Joel Osteen, whoever, right? Why are they so popular? Because they're, I love the word milk toast. I have no idea where it comes from. It's spelled funny with... But just bland, just bland, doesn't really say anything profound or always gets close, but never there. You know, they'll get so up to, up to Jesus dying to save you, which you, but then uh, they just don't, they just don't make that last step. All right. Well, the, the Christian bookstore is a great example of that. And it can be because instead of saying, all right, there's strong traditions in the Christian church that we and, and you can read widely. So read from the Eastern Church, read from the, the Church Fathers, read from the Church Fathers of the West and the East, read from Roman Catholic thinkers, you know, like read Benedict, um, or whatever he was called before, um, who had some great writings. His, his book, Jesus of Nazareth, is a great book. Um, is he perfect on everything? No. But you could do that, or you could read these other people that are kind of more bland, and you'd be able to read them more critically. But that's not what the Christian bookstore did. It said, smorgasbord... Just come and just eat and be filled. You know, we can learn from each other. Well, okay, maybe. Uh, but no discernment. That's the problem. That's the same thing. You turn on the Christian radio station, same problem, right? So uh, what is the, I mean, he's talking to them in Colossians as you have been taught. Like, mm-hmm. So they were taught something by somebody? Yeah, Epiphas, who we'll meet in the last chapter. He names him by name. Yeah, the founding pastor. Paul has never been there, oh, okay. but he knows of them. Right, and he's trying to encourage them. So he knows that they were taught the truth, but now they're listening to other teachers who are, namely the truth of what God has revealed in the scriptures. Now, probably at this point, they don't have a lot of scripture anyway. Right? One of the reasons he's writing to them. They might have one gospel. You know, it's, it's, maybe it's John, because John writes it later on, so maybe that, maybe it's John's gospel. And at this point, maybe everything they have is oral tradition at this point. They, might, they have their Old Testament... They might not even be able to afford to have all of the Old Testament scrolls. They only have Isaiah and, and the Psalms or something, right? So that's another thing that we want to recognize. It's that the church is in its infancy. And so the 2,000-page book and be like chapter and verse because um, it's just too expensive. It wasn't quite collected the way that it will be in a few hundred years. <clears throat> but... Um, <laughs> But Paul has this presumption that's really kind of a step. If Jesus sends someone to you who speaks with Jesus' Jesus's authority and according to Jesus' word, that the Spirit will work faith and, you will be faith and he will make you faithful. If you refuse the one whom he sends, you will listen to other teachers who will deceive you with persuasive words or empty words or deceitful philosophy or whatever. Empty deceit. All right? That's kind of astounding for us because we usually think of this is another falsehood that we, we is that faith um faith is a collaborative venture <laughs> so jesus speaks to you and then you have to reach out and like shake his hand basically so he's like here you go and then you have to put out your hand and, right which the picture yeah you're shaking your head no the picture is um is one of election. That's the that's the technical doctrinal word we use. God he gives you faith. He implants it into your heart through his word. To those who like it and like it not, to quote the hymn. 
So freeing for us as Christians is, is that our call is simply to speak God's word with truth and in sincerity and love, right? And not, not seeking to cause division, but seeking to bring correction, right? And then let the things, let, let the Holy Spirit, right? instead of we having to manipulate, coerce, what? Do this kind of stuff. Use philosophy. Um, maybe repackage Jesus a little bit so he's a little bit more palatable and less offensive. You know, that may be like that may be what's motivating to the United Methodist Church. It's like if we if we're more accepting of the alphabet people, then they'll come to church and they'll hear of Jesus, and then maybe maybe they'll come. But they're like, well, more accepting as in like you're going to ordain them as clergy in your church. Openly rebellious against God's word? Hmm. I don't think that's going to actually do what you think it's going to do. Right. As you say, yes, all are welcome. Um, and and what it, all are welcome to do what? To hear God's word, to repent, and to turn to Christ and live, which God will work by his spirit. Or not, often. That's the, that's the other problem. <laughs> um, is that Jesus is... Uh, this is where C.S. Lewis is helpful in Narnia, right? Where he's... Um, He's, he's not a tame lion, but he is a good lion, right? And so sometimes he appears as like this ferocious beast, Jesus does to us. And other times, gentle up with the big cat, <laughs> right? It's the beautiful picture of a lion, right? Because it can do both. And that's a, um, that Jesus is the lion of Judah as in his farewell blessing. All right, so um, abounding in it... What is it? Faith. Abounding in the faith with thanksgiving. I don't know. Why'd they put a little... Ah! 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 Text tradition. You ready? It could be... If you drop in it, it's just abounding in thanksgiving or with thanksgiving. Um, I mean, that's what I mean. Yeah, that's what going with thanksgiving. Yeah, with thanksgiving. So there's different manuscript traditions. This is the Byzantine text. So most of you probably have more of the one of the Western texts. Vibe uh, either took it out in the West or somebody added it in in the East. <laughs> um, so New King James is. That's why they put the little four. To, they should have just italicized it. So you, but anyway. Yeah. Because abounding with thanksgiving, Lord, um, or the faith. Right, or just being thankful that you're with Jesus. I mean, there's lots of ways you could take that. Here, the in it, and I don't know what that is. All right, so that this is your life right here, isn't it? You've received Christ Jesus the Lord. You walk, you're rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, or up, uplift. How do we saying it in the in the why statement? Was it uplifted? Right, something about being uplifted at the end. I know I haven't memorized it. I'll work on that. Bounding with Thanksgiving. All right. So that's enough. That should be sufficient. But it hasn't been, right? So now, beware that lest anyone do what? Yeah, that's not a literal translation. I bet if I, ca- if I click this, it's going to give me a literal. What do you want to bet? Ah, there you go. Yeah, plunder you or take you captive or carry you away would be another way to do it. Carry you away captive, right? So you can think of other places where Paul says that. Mm-hmm. Where you say, um, be not like those who are carried away by every wind and false doctrine. Isn't that how it goes? I can't remember. This is in Timothy. Yeah. So it's to be carried away. Like you get caught up in things. You said propaganda. This is, this is the, the, the advantage to having uh, useful idiots, which unfortunately probably describes most of us and our neighbors too. Because uh, how, how can you be made useful? idiots maybe look up I don't know right and um, my friend Pastor Riley on our, on our podcast said uh, I think it was on Friday this last um, after you after you scroll you um, to to recall five things that you read <laughs> anything right but it is affecting you and it and it is things even if you can't repeat them verbatim. 
right? So you wonder, like, how do the kids stuff? Well, there's agitators. Oh, Mike asked me about this. There's agitators, of course, that come in. And then the children are already, have been indoctrinated to be politically active. And they'll come in and say, here's your cause. And they're like, oh, we have this cause. And, they're, you know, and then, shh, and it just ramps up. And they say it's, it's orchestrated. But they're, the, you can see how they're carried away. Because when you, act, when, I don't know if you watch any interviews, the, the funny ones are like, so why are you protesting? I, we don't know. It's something with Israel. I'm not sure. Like, but you're saying the chant. Yeah. I mean, to describe being just carried away by something. Group mentality, mob mentality, right? Mob mentality. Right? There's always a problem with the mob. Because I had I remember distinctly uh, uh, late December I had a I had a friend of mine post on Facebook, December of twenty twenty. Um, should I go to Jan should I go to the Capitol on January sixth? He didn't go. But he but you know, he was politically active and he wanted he wanted to show his support and you know, he had had his opinions of the election and and thankfully, he decided not, it wasn't worth the trip. Roped up with all those people. And were there agitators? Were there bad actors? Of course. But a lot of people just got caught up in it, right? And that's, uh, it's just, I don't know why we can't be sympathetic to that. I mean, are you innocent? Well, probably, sometimes. Like, you walk through the Capitol. Like, so, they open the doors. I, I don't know why you would need to be in jail for that. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't seem to be appropriate for the crime right right but if you hit somebody or beat somebody that's assault i mean right or if you destroyed property right anyway yeah to be carried away that i like that that's a good way to do it or carried off captive through philosophy now here um um we want to be careful because I, there is a role for philosophy and it used to be subservient or subordinate to for Christians who studied philosophy. But what do we talk about? What happens when philosophy gets out Jesus? Then it becomes its own thing, right? Um, very popular philosophers that are practical philosophy. Um, Jordan Peterson would be a big one. He's realizing that the things that he was saying were true, in a sense, but they didn't lead anywhere because they were groundless. They didn't have, they weren't rooted or built in anything. And actually, I mean, over the years now, it's been, well, it's God's word. That's like the story in the world. It, all the other stories seem to be dependent upon God's word and the story of the Bible. So that's pretty profound, right? Um, he calls it the Ur text, the original text. And then, and then now his wife converted to Catholicism. He's like, I, and now he's, he's flirting with the East and talking to Eastern. He's like, they understand, they, they understand what's behind what I've only been able to observe with my intellect and, and my senses, that there's actually a greater truth on, that's actually what I see happening and what I see manifest in people. I can describe it, but I couldn't describe why. So, yeah, so, um, so there's a way that philosophy of Jesus, too, in a helpful way, and some have done that, uh, it's, it's actually set in opposition to Jesus. And well, that's what's happening in this church, we can presume, I think. Because he's saying, don't, don't let them keep carrying you by their philosophy. And empty deceit. So, uh, what's the and regular deceit? That would be a good question. <laughs> hmm, right. Not, well, yes, deceit is deceit. I mean, that's a truism, so that, I don't know how helpful that is. Was there a lot of deceit against? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, we do say we have, like, white lies. We, we make different kinds of deceit. It's mostly harmless, you know, like Santa Claus or something. It gives you meaning and purpose in your life. What you're talking about here, no, this, this leads you to empty, to be, to empty. Actually, it's going to empty you of, of Jesus. It's the kind of deceit that leads you away from faith in Christ and empties you of Christ. It has, it has no substance. It has no incarnation because it has no person, no Jesus. It's just ideas. So Ethan and I were listening. I think you might remember. I don't know. That was a long drive. 
Thankfully, his ride decided to come another hour closer to me, an hour and a half. So that we got back before late. But uh, uh, the, it was a philosopher we were listening to, and he, a Catholic one. He kept saying, let me give you actually a real example. That's just an abstract idea. That's just ideas. Let me show you how this actually is manifest in the world. Right? So it's not, it's not disembodied. It's not just an idea, but it actually has an embodiment. Um, and so he would use the example of family or culture or tribe or what, you know, ways that it's actually evident. All right. And so these are ideas that actually can't even be falsified. That'd be another way that they're empty. Um, so that's like a truism, but things that, that cannot be falsified. Well, um, you know, we came to earth on the back of space crystals, you know, or some kind of fun. Well, I mean, evolution is actually an empty philosophy in that way falsified because there's no observer and even the things they use for observation are insufficient there's adaptation clearly in the world adapted within within the known history right we've seen this some creatures have died they're extinct they're gone so there's been survival I have a problem saying that as well but not trans- transitions of species we don't have we don't have observed evidence of that we don't have millions of years of evidence that, um, that we can actually... So that's an empty philosophy as well, because it can't be falsified. Um, here, according to the, ooh, the tradition of men, were we talking about tradition? I think we were, right? So, so what he's describing here is the church, in Gal- uh, the church in Colossae was rooted or grounded in Christ Jesus, the preaching of his, his word, you know, baptism, Lord's Supper, the, the things... So Christ instituted, right? And then there's somebody else coming alongside or coming along that, that's speaking empty or deceiving words. They, they've invaded the church. Not, it's, not, it's not a new thing. It's, it's, all right? So not every tradition is good. Because probably the, the longest standing tradition is the lie of the serpent, right? That you could be like God. Right? And that tradition was handed forward to Cain. Cain handed it down to his sons, to Tubal Cain. You just read the story. You end up with Abel. You end up with the flood. You end up with um, the his- that, that tradition keeps finding its way forward, right? Because it's actually there. What? Yeah, in our flesh. Yeah, yeah, sinful hearts. And that's what he calls it here. The tradition of men, according to the principles of the world. Ooh, these are heavy words, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, those are principles of the world. There's nothing new under the sun. Paul was dealing with this, and we have to deal with it too. And obviously we do too. Does anybody have a different translation of that according to the. Elemental spirits. Yeah, I like that. Elemental spirits. Thanks, Leah. Yeah, the, sometimes. Yeah, there. It's the the stoichi, uh, the basic principles or elemental spirits. Mm-hmm. It is connected to the flesh, but remember that that the corruption of Adam and Eve, the 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 corrupt flesh, the heart, mind, soul, the whole the whole deal by submitting to the word of the serpent, brought corruption into the entire world. We read about that earlier in chapter one. So the whole by sin. And now it is part of the basic principles of this fallen world. Right? Um, that we live in open rebellion to God's word. It's already established back in chapter 1, if you remember, is that despite that, God sent his son Christ. And he's still holding the world together for the sake of his son and for the sake of your faith in him. i point this out to people, but I think it's helpful to remember that the only reason and you're not dead yet is because Jesus. The only fossil fuel fuels is they're not even fossil fuels. Who, who coined the phrase? Somebody has. They don't come from fossils. They come from plant and animal matter. And we buy the product. Okay. Anyway, um, the only reason we haven't run out of resources is because Jesus. Um, the reason why God. God hasn't caused us to fall into decay and, and um, 
our bodies to fall into ruin and be disease-ridden is because Jesus, right? Ultimately for faith in him, um, but also for the sake that the church preserved until the whole host to quote Revelation. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of uh, you know, Exodus when he's in the heart, so mm-hmm. the Red Sea, mm-hmm. like you're at this narrow path, and you have to follow it on. Yeah, exactly. We talked about this on the podcast on Friday. I haven't posted the audio version yet because I had to drive to Iowa yesterday if you didn't hear. But, I mean, there is this... Some of the pictures of the Christian church as being like an oasis, and I think it's helpful, right? That, the, that like we stand so apart from the world. And so we don't do things in the church the same way. We don't talk the same way. We don't think, uh, like now, it's clear that we don't even think of creation in, in the same way or the way that God made us, male and female, in the same way. And so, so we do end up standing apart even though we're in the world. Um, but uh, my, my co-host, Pastor Riley, said, he likes to think of it more as like a forward operating base. So the more of the warfare language that fits his personality. He's a little bit more aggressive than I am a lot more. Um, so, but like a forward operating base. So you're, you're in enemy territory and yet you set your perimeter, right? And you have guards, you stand, you stand watch, there's watchmen on the gate, the whole, and that picture is in the Bible too. So you're in the world then either, right? Like you don't belong there in one sense, right? But you can expand your perimeter, right? So you can build a larger community, but, you, you know, that has its share of challenges, right? Because now you have more watchmen, large, long, you know, there's more vectors of attack, right? So typically small is stronger for Christian congregations. Our church has understood that. That's why we always, when you got a little bit too big, you just start another church and another community. Go to that community, every community. It wasn't just because of transportation costs, you know, to get on your horse or something, convenience, but this was long before the days of jumping in your car and, and you're there, you know, I mean, the saddle, the horse and everything, um, and the cart. Again, this idea that you're, that we're, these are, we're just establishing a presence, and maybe if every village is covered, then the effect of our, of the preaching of the gospel in these places will continue to creep and maybe merge together, right? So that, the, and we overlap so that like Fredonia, ourselves, Adel, like out in the country, although we don't interact very much with them, you know, but then there's at least the opportunity for people to hear the gospel, right? And for God to be at work in our, in our communities. As interacting with each other. That's the idea. Instead of just having one large church, you would have this, and then that influence can spread. And, it, and we can work for congregations. Yeah. Um, like I said, you go from Watertown, you go from Watertown um, to Holy Hill, like that. Mm-hmm. I had never seen so many little old Lutheran churches. Right. Like, no idea out there. They're, they were just mm-hmm. like, everywhere we grew up, there was a little Lutheran church. And we come in, let me guess, Lutheran. <laughs> and we see a church. Right. right. Yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't antagonistic. And maybe it was, it was a little practical. But helpful because, like, I mean, this congregation could be, a, you know, with one pastor, it could be twice as large, probably, and we could still manage it. But once you get to a couple hundred members, almost unmanageable. I mean, like, if you're making a shut in visit every day, you almost just need a pastor just doing that, then, right? Especially if you have other things. Hmm? Right. If you don't know each other, you can also. But like if Matt's not here, we notice. Oh, I notice. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. No, we would notice, right? Because cause it's more apparent, right? Maybe. Maybe. All right. So uh, tradition of men here is the basic principles of the world. That's the sinful principles of the world, not according to Christ. So now he's contrasting that with Christ who holds all things together. So there's this there's that's transposed on each other. But Christ is holding everything together, but at the same time, we're trying to tear everything apart <laughs> with, our, with our philosophy and empty deceit. All right. For in him, Christ dwells in these superlatives, all the fullness, all and fullness, both are actually superlative, of the Godhead bodily. All right. So there, it's not empty, it's bodily. And you are complete 
Again, superlative, complete, finished. Who is the head of all principality and power. So even those with their philosophy and empty deceit are under him, whether they know it or know it. So what, I, what, I th- what I'm sensing is that he's hearing from me from subtle of what's happening in, in Colossae is that they think there's another power alongside Christ that's as powerful or, or even a lesser God, but a God to Jesus, gods that aren't subject to Jesus. This is Gnostic. This will get very well developed in the next couple hundred years. But that there's, um, Christ is, is God amongst the gods. Right? You get this sometimes from the people who love space alien stuff. You know, and they'll say, well, Jesus could be the savior of this world, but there's other worlds. So there's probably other saviors then too. And you're like, oh my goodness. God, I have no idea if any of that's true. So I can't, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Not even, not even speculatively. It's like what Jesus reveals, you know, is that this is, the, we are the apex of all, we're the center of the universe. And actually the center of the, center of the, of the solar system and the center of, of the world um, is Christ crucified. We talked about that. And so what he, you can see what he's doing. He's saying, there's all these other people and, and things that you could be listening to, but you need to get back to the, the core principle, the core principality, <laughs> the principality and power, which is Jesus himself. Right? So he's trying, I think he's trying to draw them back uh, where his, their first love, their first love. Now this bodily thing is very important. And uh, we'll talk about it a little bit. But um, remember, the, the Gnostic thing, Gnosis, knowledge and wisdom, that's, that's the higher existence, is your like, soul or spirit. And the lower existence is your body. And so you're trying to escape your body, ultimately. It's kind of Buddhist in that way, too. Right? But that you're trying to turn mortal frame into this higher reality of being. How well that's developed here, I'm not sure. We don't know yet where it goes. It does end up going to like, like full on, like spirit is greater than flesh. And, and not that we were made body, soul, and spirit. Heart, mind, strength. We talked about all that last week. All the different ways Paul talks about it. Meaning, um, this is the spiritual, not religious criticism. Here it is. We'll, le- we'll leave you with this. The people who say that they could be a Christian as long as Jesus is in their heart, if you want to use that language, but without being hearing Jesus, ears, which is a very physical experience, right? Listening. And also without fellow Christians, without being a part of the body or the building, or you want to use, um, that you've actually then are going to be much more subject to these things, philosophy and empty deceit. So, um, bodily. And that's why I think he goes to a body, body picture here in the, in the next few verses, right? Where he talk, which is always a fun conversation. So we'll leave that to next time <laughs> to talk about circumcision. Any, any questions? So far, that core, maybe it's even just those few verses, just six through eight. Did we only do three verses today? Uh, so it is. Yeah, but I mean, so profound, right? Yeah. yeah. You've received Christ, walk with him, be rooted and grounded in him. Don't let other people, don't let other things deceive you from him who is, who has given you all the fullness of, of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him. You don't need to go anywhere else. You've got it all there. Think of the implications of that through the week. Talk about it next week, maybe. All right. All right. Adios. See you in church.